The first time I came up here with Wade, um, it was, uh, we weren't engaged, were we? No. 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 <laughs> he was showing me his country he loves and decided to go um, up Mount Adzaidza and do a, a two-week walk up there, 12-day walk, and get dropped in by footplane at Arctic Lake. And so we had um, very rudimentary food packs. And the first thing I did was pack everything in Ziploc bags and didn't get the air out. So when we did the food drop, everything exploded all over the mountains. So we ate basically one meal a day. You know, it, breakfast, lunch, and dinner was the same meal. It was oatmeal, lentils, and... Um, chili pepper. Chili pepper and different spices from all over the world mixed together. Because uh, each day was going to be an ethnic food day. So, so uh, that was... Um, we were picking out um, little... Uh, little gravel out of every meal to make sure we didn't break a tooth on the trip. Um, so that was the start of the trip. The second day of the trip, I was walking on Arctic That Lake. was actually midway through the trip. That was oh, during, that was that midway. Was a food okay. drop. The real so, story was what you're about the to tell. First, yeah, the first day we walked around the lake, and it was such beautiful landscape, and I had never walked on such wild landscape, dramatic landscape, using animal trails. So um, in the rocky, it was all rocky shale around there, there weren't a lot of animal trails, so it was mostly you know, um, uneven boulders and things like that. And I had a 40 pound pack on my back, and I was just admiring the scenery, and I just tripped and smashed headlong into um, the boulders and impaled myself. And Wade thought, you know, okay, cracked skull, concussion. You can still see right there. Everything. <laughs> so, the mark of its eyes. All of a sudden, <laughs> this was an emergency, and we were, what, 12 days from four pickup? Day, four day, 12 days from pickup, four, four days, days from walk the out. nearest road, yeah. pre satellite mm -hmm. phones. Yeah. So, so she nothing. was bleeding we like had, a. We had nothing, like an old, old sow. Anyway, um, there's nothing to do except uh, stabilize me and be sure I wasn't concussed. Luckily, I wasn't. Um, so anyway, I got two shiners, couldn't see a thing, a migraine headache, and um, they, and finally started walking because we just had to continue. And so the next day, we were going to cross boulder fields that the boulders the size of houses. And we were like little ants crawling up, and I couldn't see a thing. So they were leading me. <laughs> so, go right, go left. Your eyes left. were sealed shut from so, the injury. Totally sealed with a horrible migraine. Uh, they unloaded my pack, so I was carrying, what, about 10 pounds then? More like a day pack. So they had to gear up with all my gear. And we just had to survive. So that was my first introduction to the country. And we got lost a lot up there. Well, there's, you know, that's t rough country, and we were we we didn't carry any gas with us for stoves or that kind of thing. So we always had to find timber. But you, to find timber on the west side of Adzaza, you have to suck down these um, draws, and there's so much seepage coming from the snow melt and the ice melt that those draws have no solid ground. So you go down, and it was miserable weather, gales, wi force winds, and and we, you know, we go down there and. Um, it was rough, and and with Hail, rain and snow. With us on that trip was my old partner from Spatsizi, Big Al, and Big Al had had a sort of spiritual experience in Spatsizi when we were rangers there, and he had we'd been up on Spatsizi Plateau, and suddenly I looked in his eye, and there'd been a glint of a flicker of sort of what looked like metal, and I looked and we I saw what seemed to be a bit of tinfoil coming down a draw with the wind. Of course, there's no tinfoil up there, but anyway, this this object sort of took out over the valley of Mink Creek, and we both thought we could, we never lost sight of it. Uh, but what ended up coming back to us was a golden eagle, and I, being more rational, sort of thought, well, that's coincidence, you know, curious, whatever. But for better or for worse, Big Al took it as being an actual event that had happened. So in time, he quit his job as a park ranger, and he. He went looking for the big bird, and in the end, he would spend literally six and seven months alone in the wilderness, um, up the Chesley in the heart of the Grand Canyon, um, in the remote reaches of the Spatsizi, seeking the golden bird. And he actually created his own religion around this encounter. And you know, he walked the fine line between psychosis and enlightenment. And 
Curiously, I, I once went to Johannes Wilbert at UCLA, who was um, head of the Latin American Studies Department and had been deeply involved in the whole Castaneda thing um, as a critic, you know, but was a world's expert on shamanism. And I said, I'm going to tell you about this man I know. I'll tell you what he does, but I won't tell you what culture or, or who he is. So I described precisely what Big Al did. And Johannes said, that's a pure shamanic path. And then the moment I told Johannes who Al was and where this was happening, he said, that's a recipe for psychosis. Because the metaphor of the shaman is that the shaman swims in the mystic waters the rest of us would drown in. But if he or she doesn't have a community to bring those insights back to, it can be a path to madness. At the same time, Big Al um, demonstrably had achieved something. One time we went up this mountain with him and almost as an act of nostalgia, because we, we were rangers together for uh, two four-month seasons, and we walked everywhere in the Spatsizi. We were young, we were strong, we had the mandate to mm -hmm. do precisely that. And he told me as we went up this trail we've cut up in the woods here to Sky Mountain, he said if we, if we do what he, everything he said at that point in his life was kind of portentous. And so he said, if we do the silent stalk of the mountain, the big bird will come. Well, sure enough, and I swear this happened, uh, he was maybe half a mile ahead of me, and I was pulling out these sort of surveyor stakes from these mining companies, and uh, I suddenly saw him. He was six foot four, this massive man, uh, with his arms outstretched, and at his feet was a golden eagle with its wings outstretched. Now, I say that because on that same trip, um, once Gail had stabilized, and she's far too modest, this was a very serious injury, and the, she's so brave because the entire time, she never even told us she had a, a painful migraine. You know, every time we said, how are you, she'd say, fine. It, would, it, was, almost, fine. it was almost a nerve aid <laughs> because no when mirror. someone has been potentially no concussed, to look at what I oh, look I've got like. a photograph of her. Oh, her face was terrifying. Hamburger. And incidentally, she used to be a fashion model in Paris <laughs> no, with her that. face on billboards. Oh, on, all no, of it's, Well, it's true. It's true. And now I've got no. the permanent mark of its zides on her forehead. And, uh, but the, the thing is that when she had stabilized, uh, uh, you know, we were, we were camped out at Raspberry Pass, and that's when we had this airdrop from Mike Jones. And as Gail said, the, the whole food went on. But then as we came out of well, Raspberry Pass, Big Al and I had an argument. I thought we should stay high and go right out on the plateau. He wanted to take the horse trail through Raspberry, thinking that it would sweep up to the plateau on the other side. And I felt we should just get up and find a route. And as it turns out, I mean, I'm not saying I was right, but but we ended up, I mean, there's a huge slog from the timber back up. It was just a very rough, yeah, really Down rough. The, the but and and toward Fell toward the tree over creek. Oh, I mean, just you know. Um, but anyway, Big Al and I wanted to climb Mount Idzida, and um, to climb. It's Idza, really. You can't climb it from the south because it's the, the exposure is, is dramatic. And the actual summit are just two pinnacles of rock that stick up from the southern side. So you really have to go up the shoulder from the north, and that implies traversing the entire summit ice field, which is not trivial. It's about f six or seven kilometers long. And uh, Gail stayed below at our camp at a place we call Wolf Pass because we found a wolf skeleton there once. And uh, literally, the whole time we had been walking the length of Adzaidza, a golden eagles had been above us, literally. And then as she is saying goodbye to us, as we walk up this nose, she's waving. You did a great descent. Uh, yeah, we're going up, and a golden eagle feather fell into her hand. I mean, this is not New Age gobbledygook. This actually <laughs> happened. <It's> serendipity. <laughs> and then I get up on top of the glacier, and of course we've been walking all the way from Arctic, and so we're not carrying a climbing rope. And once we're on the glacier, about half an hour in, I fall through a crevasse. And I'm, my feet are literally suspended in the darkness. And only the crust of snow and my hands are holding so me you up. You look like a sp eagle then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just very lucky that the crust held and I was able to crawl myself, or I would have died. The eagle. And of course, being young and stupid, uh, when that happened, did we back off and walk back down? No, of course not. We just kept going to climb its Idza. So Big Al, you know, Big Al. Um, had a huge influence on on both of us and when we bought this place actually we built we wanted to build a spiritual temple for him you know just really because we felt he should have a place he could do his thing and so that was really the genesis of some of the buildings around here my oddly enough the, the my memory that that led to the 
to this place, which has really been the, um, the anchor of our life, this property, in the sense that it's been the well that we've drunk from as a family the other 10 or um, 9 months of the year when I've had to do a great deal of traveling and Gail's been busy raising the kids and so on. The kids have been schooled back in, back, back in, this, in Washington, D.C. Um, this actually was, in a sense, born of a dream I had when I was a little boy. I had a very, very strong dream when I was about five years old that um, there was just a sort of a place on a lake, um, a rural place like this, funky, and, and uh, there was a fence row that came up, and this little boy gets off the river, the lake, and goes running up the hill into the arms of an old man. And uh, it was a very endearing sort of scene. And even at the age of five, as I woke from that dream, I knew that the man, that, that the, 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 the figure in the dream, who was I, um, was the old man, not the boy. And I realized that one day I would have a grandson who would run into my arms at a place like this. And he had gotten off in a red canoe. So the whole thing started, a red chestnut canoe. So the first, the whole, this whole thing began when I bought a, uh, a, 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 a chestnut canoe and ran it down the Stikeen a couple of times, beat it up a lot, and had to have it repainted. So I kind of pushed the dream sequence a little bit by painting it red from green. And I had this red chestnut canoe. And I was always, for years, I was looking for a place to, it would be. And uh, then I was, I used to fly over this property coming out of the Spatsisi in the 70s looking down and wondering, what is that place? You know, how do you live in the wild like this? And what would it mean if I could live there? And what would it mean in my life if I had the money to be able to live in a place like that? And uh, then when Gail and I came up that fateful summer, um, I was honestly so impressed by her character on Adzaidza. I mean, I was, already was madly in love with her, but something about that, I'm not saying I asked her to marry me because of that trip, but there was something about that summer we spent up here that just, you know, I just was amazed that she would be able to come from the United States, from having lived in Paris and Tunisia and worked in, as an anthropologist in the North African desert, that she would be able to come to this country and immediately love it. You know, it really well, was... Like Colorado. Like well, she had, yeah, yeah. Lots of yeah. big peaks in Colorado, 14,000 foot peaks that as a teen I climbed. But anyway, so then, then we did a bunch of other trips that summer uh, it, with Big Al into the Grand Canyon and we, we, we um, rafted the Upper Stikine and all kinds of wonderful trips and uh, uh, stayed down at, the, at Mike Jones's place and as it turned out conceived our first child there and um, we just knew we were going to be together forever. And that summer, by complete chance or tragedy, the, the owner of this place, uh, Joe McNabb, sadly had a heart attack and passed away. And Mike Jones brought us up here and we said, we, we bought it sight on, you know, we just said, this is it, we're going to buy it. It's, it's not just a well we drink from. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it's never out of our thoughts because, be, not just because we've been involved um, uh, politically in the conservation efforts up here, but because we have these ongoing and ever deepening relationships with the Taltan First Nation, which to me are, you know, in a weird way, I never set out. One thing I never try to do up here, and I certainly Gail doesn't do, is act the anthropologist, even though we're both by training anthropologists. Just, we, we love the, the beautiful landscape here, the, the wilderness. So but but also but also you know we we've been effectively or I've especially I suppose me because I'm probably more engaged with the community in effect I've been doing what what anthropologists call longitudinal research you know I mean and I don't think of it that way but but because I know I'm going to be here forever I'm you know I, we've seen some actual academic anthropologists come and go like the birds in this country and you know the tall tank called June anthropology season uh, and, mm -hmm. and anthropologist season, you know, and yet because we've, we've had such a slower pace, it's, to me, it's been really revelatory as to what real deep anthropological research would be like. Then our, our daughter at one point, when she was five years old, uh, our youngest daughter disappeared from the property and we really were scared. I mean, we had no idea where she was. And it took hours to find her. And she was a mile up the, not a mile, but half a mile up the creek. 
and I found her with her little purple bonnet on and a pair of work gloves, and she was kneeling over a dead black bear cub, trying to, with rivers of tears coming out of her, trying to stroke it back to life. And I immediately looked for the sow that had killed that cub, saw nothing, and then we laid the little cub to rest on a bed of moss beneath a cleft of rock, and then I walked her back down, and then Alec was waiting, and he took that as a big sign. And in, in Athabascan uh, uh, culture, you know, it was very typical that if you had ten kids and someone else had two, you'd raise some of the other kids. It's how you survived in a hunting and gathering situation. Mm -hmm. And but there was always that notion of a of a child that would stay by you. And Alex used to say of Raina, she's the one gonna stay by you. And curiously, although our older daughter is more interested in outdoor activities, kayaking, rock climbing, expeditionary trips and stuff, um, Raina who on the face of it is more urban and and more in a way sophist you know is the one who really you know, and when Raina was a young uh, really uh, uh, and, and when she was later um, uh, as a teenager she got a le near lethal disease and all the doctors said to us you couldn't possibly take her up here because she would she would she so far from medical help medical. and 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 uh, and I said, look, if she's going to die, she's going to die where she wants to be. And so I insisted. She, and so it was bringing her back here that began her curing process. And then once she was stabilized um, from this very serious illness, um, for Tara's 16th birthday, uh, I took Tara to a peyote ceremony with the Navajo. We were making a film. And Tara, who, God, she'd be a great ethnographer. I mean, she can go into any <laughs> culture and just... Bzzz. So she's right in there with the women, you know, in a kind of a chaotic Navajo scene that would intimidate most middle-class white girls. Tara just like... <laughs> is in the, up to the elbows with the mutton meat and that. And she happens to mention the story of the, of, um, tell the illness story to the roadman's wife. And the roadman's wife goes to the roadman, unbeknownst to us, and says what, about this illness. And that night in the teepee, the roadman came up to me and said, it was that black bear. And Tara hadn't said a word about this black bear thing. And so all night long in the peyote, all night long in the peyote ceremony, he's praying for the well-being of our daughter. And of course, she, in the end, she, 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 she fully recovered. Um, but, but, you know, you can't ever think of this property without thinking of that period. So, I mean, there's layers upon layers of both joy and agony and, and happiness, which is typical of all... Um, places and it, it uh, but in continuity uh, of the children growing up here. In continuity, in yeah. What we've wrestled with is how long we'll stay here, particularly with some of these industrial developments happening. The night that I knew we would never leave this place was the night that Rain had, as an adult, disappeared on this lake. And just the previous week, this normally is very cold, and just the previous week, some world class kayakers who had just successfully run the Grand Canyon of Stikine you know, less than 100 people have ever done that, took our canoes out and flipped some of them, and were, I had to rescue them on the edge of hypothermia. This, is a, this can be a hazardous lake. So Raina had gone off, um, um, and she wasn't back by dark. And I took the skiff out, and I knew I'd probably find her a favorite spot, which is, the, is that knoll of rock right across there, where there's a little... Bluffs. The bluffs. And there's a game trail that skirts the woods and lifts you up about 100 feet over the lake and it's a startling shift of perspective and our lodge appears just kind of um, nestled in the arms of Sky Mountain and as I approached in the darkness I, I, I could hear that she was sobbing you know uncontrollably and I reached her and I asked the obvious question she said daddy this, this is a quote daddy this place is just so beautiful it's a vortex of my life it's where I was born and where I want to die and uh, and uh, I, I just don't know why it's they're doing what they're doing to it, you know, the mines. And even even as the miners and engineers at the Red Chris site, not seven kilometers from where we stood at that moment, went about their business of dismantling Tottingen, uh, I promised her that that we would wait out the mine. And even if I wasn't alive to experience a return of silence to the lake, she would be, and her children's children would be. And that's what the tall ten mean about staying put. And that's why Mary Dennis, Oscar's mother, says, you know, the, the measure of uh, tall ten uh, is, is, no, is no longer blood, but attitude to landscape. And 
she meant that not in a, in, in a sense of denying the uniqueness of their ethnicity, but simply saying that at this point in time, what matters is how we treat the ground and what spirit of place we, we nurture. And I just came out of Spatsizi where I spent a week kind of guiding for um, a group of nine um, visitors, you know, and, and revisiting a lot of places that I hadn't seen since the 70s when I was first a bark ranger. Um, and it, it, uh, uh, it, it was a kind of interesting kind of um, opportunity to compare, in a sense, my gestalt about this country uh, then and now. I mean, I remember coming up here and it seemed like a very long way north. The Stuart Cassiar at that time in the 70s, it, I mean, it only was actually even connected in 1972. And at that time, it was really just a series of logging tracks cobbled together. It didn't become a, a serious road until um, well after I first came up here. So you left, you left um, you know, Smithers or Terrace and came north, and you sort of measured distance, not in terms of miles or gas consumption, but in tires and axles worn out by the effort. And... Um, and I remember also going into the Spatsizi being sort of acutely aware of, of the danger of bears because two parks planners a year before had been mauled by bears and the government sort of forced us to carry around this ridiculous shotgun. And just, just you, know, the, you know, how I had learned to make my way through a country where there are no trails, you follow game trails, which become horse trails, which become highways in a sense. But... Uh, whereas now the whole Spatsizi feels like a garden to me. You know, I, I know every plant, I know the habits of every animal, um, I can anticipate the weather, I, I, I never feel threatened by anything. I feel, I feel like I can walk through that country with such ease that it's become, it's just really become my home. And there's no, there's in a way there's no corner of it that I haven't visited. And I feel, you know, that's how I feel here. I, I you know, I, uh, you know, we watch people come up here and you can sort of tell their ability to kind of deal with this country or not. And, you know, I, I just feel so fortunate to have had the opportunity to to have come to know a place in Canada so well and to feel so comfortable in it that it really is home. I mean, this will always be home. I mean, this will be the lake where my ashes will be spread, you know. Actually, I've probably put some of them on top of the mountain too, you know. But it's no question this is, I mean, when I think of, you know, in the time that we've owned this, we've had several other homes, raised our kids for six years in Vancouver, and in Washington in two different homes, but this has really been our home.